Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the On Becoming Legend podcast. This week, I have an interview that I'm very excited to bring you. We have Keenan Burton. Keenan Burton is a former NFL player, entrepreneur, and real estate investor. Played football for the University of Kentucky as a wide receiver and a kick returner. Later was drafted in the fourth round by the St. Louis Rams in 2008. In the history of the University of Kentucky, Keenan is the fourth all-time in receptions, third in receiving yards, second in touchdowns, third in all-purpose yards, third person ever to earn more than 1,000 receiving yards in a season, and the fifth player ever to earn over 4,000 all-purpose yards. And that is barely beginning to touch his performance as an athlete. In 2009, Keenan entered the 10th game in his rookie year as the leading receiver on his team with 25 catches, later went on to achieve the rank of national director with ID Life, currently also works with the tech company iBoomerang. Arguably the most important, he's also a father and a husband. Keenan, welcome to the show, my man. Appreciate you, man. Thanks for having me. So before we begin, man, is it okay if I just throw out a few more stats on your athletic career? I, I I, I don't, I mean, I'm sure you, you've probably heard this and, and beat this to death, man. But as I was doing some research on you, I, I really started to be pretty stunned at how athletic you are and just how many, you know, records and high performance marks you had gotten in your career. So you can't believe everything you read on the internet, man. So feel free to fact check me. So that's a great question. That's actually, I like that you said that, but I'm second in receiving yards and, and second, I believe I'm second in touchdowns and second or third in catches. But I'm not fourth in yard. That's something I'm proud about. That's crazy, man. Yeah, so you can't believe everything you read on the internet. I think that was straight from Wikipedia. And then it was also saying that when you went to the combine in 2008, you were one of the top performers in the vertical jump, the broad jump, the cone drill, the shuttle, the 60-yard shuttle. You came in first with a high jump uh, or vertical with a 38-and-a-half-inch vertical. And you were third in the 60-yard shuttle with 11.3 seconds. Holy cow, my man. Listen, man, I, I, I prepared, bro. I, you know, honestly, I prepared. And, and you know, it, that's God's work. I, I worked hard and, and was able to achieve a lot of great things. And just like I said, you know, preparation and talent, met, they met. And, and that's what happened for me. That's awesome, man. And, and to be honest with you, like, this is part of the reason I, I've known you for several years. And I, and I didn't know any of this stuff because I'm not a sports guy. I just... It was never big in my house. I played some sports, but it was never something that was really part of the culture. I mean, I have friends who are high school football coaches, and you go over there on the weekends, and it's, I mean, every minute there's football on the television and talking about football, living football. But having known you for all those years, man, and just learning all this stuff, I have to say it's even more impressive. You, you are a serious athlete. And the reason I say it's more impressive, though, is because it, you're so much deeper than that. There's so much more to you as a human being than just being an athlete. And um, that's what I value in my relationships. I mean, I really look for people who are well-rounded or the full package. And you're definitely one of those guys, man. It was, it was great to read all this stuff about you. But yeah, I, I'm not surprised at all to hear you say that preparation, that hard work. So I found an interesting story, though. And I don't know if this is true. So I'm going to ask you about it. But I think it takes us back to pretty much the beginning. I'd like to know about your experience with asthma. Whoa, whoa, OK. Yeah, so when I was younger, man, I, um, you know, I was, I was always talented and, and like I said, worked extremely hard, but that was a challenge that I did have. I, I um, for some odd reason, I struggled with it, especially when I played little league football and, and my dad and I used to run a lot and he would, he would find that I was, uh, I was breathing pretty heavily and he would say, we got to go get you checked out. And then he taught me, he actually, you know, he taught me, he said, running is like walking and my mindset shifted and I was able to overcome it. So I would have an inhaler before games. And by the time I was in middle school, I never had to use it again because he taught me how to control the way that I, that, that I breathe when, when we ran. So it all worked out. That's awesome, man. Yeah, so I actually had asthma as well. And pretty much for the exact same age as you mentioned, I, I, I don't remember when I played soccer when I was younger. I just remember suddenly starting to have a real hard time with runs, falling out of runs, did the inhaler thing for a while, um, only needed it before events, kind of, like you said, right. and then, I mean, for the life of me, I can't remember when it was, but I think it was middle school, maybe early high school, um, when it just seemed to, to either clear up or go away. I, I don't know. And, and maybe there's something to that. But um, that's awesome you had your dad there. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit more later on. But so you, you, said, you talked about Little League football. So you, when did you start into sports? I mean, when, when did this begin for you? I mean, I was playing sports probably at four or five years old. I mean, my dad used to take me when I was extremely, like when I was two or three years old with him when he played basketball. So I was introduced to it early on in my life. And, and um, 
I was just so eager to do something. And where I come from, you know, um, the way that you stay out of trouble is you get into activities and you do things that other people do. And I felt like that that was a chance for me to, to, to be with my friends. But, but I don't, not only that, have some fun too, you know. And, yeah, and absolutely. Figure out what I like. So sports, yeah, from, from the get-go was a big part of your life. Now, what, did you, like, were your parents athletes? How, how did it come up in the first place? even at a young age, was this something your parents really wanted you to do or did you sort of discover it on your own and, and ask them to get you into it? So my mom would kill me if I didn't say this because she's going to watch this. <laughs> so yes, my mom was an athlete. My mom actually holds the state and school record. I believe in Indiana, it could be just the school record, but I think it's both for the longest shot put. No way. So she got mad at me uh, when I was playing in the league in college that I never mentioned it. And so there you go, Mom. <laughs> uh, All right. So you come from athletes. So that explains the, uh, the, the, you know, incredible athleticism. Yeah. My dad was an All-American track runner as well. Um, so he was, he, was, uh, he was really fast. That's awesome. So sports are just in the blood. So I don't know if maybe you were too young. I think when I read online with you were around nine when you found out you, you had the, the asthma. Um, I, were you ever hospitalized with it? I, I think it said something about that. No, I had, I had um, that and also had, um, they call it S STV. It's like, um, it's, it's some type of, um, it's turned into atrial fibrillation now. So I did, well, I was hospitalized for that, but, uh, but I got over that too. And it's something that I've dealt with my whole entire life. I still oh, deal with it. Um, SVT, supraventricular tachycardia. Tachycardia, that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly what it was. Just an arrhythmia, basically. So I, I dealt with those two things, but um, it really wasn't anything serious that kept me from competing at a high level. Um, I just managed it. Now, I know that, again, we're probably going back a little too far for, for, you know, the I guess the sort of depth of thought that you develop later in life to be there. But I'm curious if if you remember, even in, in middle school, do you remember that having an effect on your mindset at all? The, um, you know, realizing you had asthma or realizing that you you had this, this physical thing that might hinder your performance? Actually, I do remember vaguely. I never looked at it as something that was a negative because honestly, at that age, I didn't even know how serious it was. You right. know, my dad sure. and my mom never really made a big deal out of it. So since they didn't make a big deal out of it, um, I didn't. I, didn't I, I appreciate the fact that they didn't because if they yeah. had, I probably would have, you know, subconsciously um, really folded to it. But I didn't, I'd never thought about it twice, honestly. It, it was what it was. It just had something I had to deal with. Yeah, it's so funny you say that. I've, I've heard a story before about a family. They, they were having a child and they were able to do some tests and they figured out before the baby was even born that there was an illness that this baby had. And the mom and dad just agreed, we're not going to tell them. Like, we're just going to treat this child as if they're a normal, healthy, fully functioning child. And I don't remember the exact details, but the, sort of the moral of the story was the kid outperformed or outlived I mean had way better standards than any doctor would have expected and I think that's that's such a valuable thing it's just like the the um the importance of your expectation on the outcome absolutely How so many times if you expect it to be a big deal it will be and if you don't it won't so yeah I think that that's awesome so one question I really like to ask um because it, it really helps fill in the gaps when you were younger and, and obviously this could change over time. So like middle school, high school, maybe even going into college, who were the major influences in your life in terms of the people that you wanted a, approval from? You know, for me, I've never really, uh, you know, needed much approval from my social circles, but it's always been huge for me to get it from my family, from my parents, from my siblings, things like that. So who were those people for you when you were growing up? You know, I'm like you, the, my social, my social circle didn't, that I didn't really care about that because yeah. I think, um, you know, I, I, my thought process was a lot different than the people that I was hanging around at the time anyway, but approval, number one, my father and my twin sister, number one, my father and my twin sister, number two, I mean, number three, it probably would have been my mother from the standpoint of not, not wanting to underachieve academically for her. Cause she, you know, she, she, she kind of parented early on with fear. She was a fear based parent. So you were, you were afraid to mess up because right. you knew there were repercussions. For that my father was more so the one that sat me down and talked to me i come from a split household so they weren't together so there really wasn't a great balance i had one extreme over here then i had another extreme over here and it was yeah. like you know trying to manage both of that but i my dad because he was such a great athlete and i heard so many stories about him and i knew that um i wanted that 
And then two, my twin sister, because, you know, we're so close. And if she thought that I did well, then I, I felt like, you know, um, I did well because that was just something that, you know, that, that, that mattered to me. And I didn't want to disappoint my mom because I knew that there were repercussions for disappointing her. And so, yeah, as I hear you telling your story, there's so many things that overlap with, with my life as well. And my father was a, was similar. Um, and yeah, I remember, like, I never even, I remember personally not caring about school all that much. Like it didn't matter to me, but I worked really hard at school because it yep. mattered to my parents. Yep. And I didn't want to underperform or let them down or disappoint them and things like that. So yeah, I can definitely, definitely relate to that. Um, when, at what point in all this, Obviously, you're still playing sports in high school, right? Yeah. So at what point do you remember realizing this is going to be my career? This is what I want to do for a living? Because for a lot of people, you know, sports are fun. It's something great. But, you know, for the I, probably 99% of athletes, high school is the end of it for a number of reasons. So I'm just curious, you know, when you realized that this was going to be a long-term thing for you. It, I, I mean, it wasn't necessarily about – it being a long-term thing for me, it was more so about survival. Because like, because of my situation and me having a twin sister and, and uh, you know, we didn't grow up in the best situation, right. but you know, we had what was necessary because our parents worked extremely, my mother worked extremely hard, my father did as well. But my dad came to me, I think it was maybe my freshman or sophomore year in high school and he told me, he said, I'm not gonna be able to pay for you and your sister to go to school. Mm -hmm. I'm just not. So, you know, you're gonna have to figure it out. Um, and I think he knew that I had a gift and he knew that he saw it. He never forced anything on me, but I think he's like, okay, if I put this in his mind, this is something that he might go out and work hard, hard to achieve. And I think at that point, I just put my head down and worked to achieve the next step in life, which was college. So it wasn't, it wasn't whether or not football was going to be my ticket to success and I was going to make millions of dollars. It was more so what's the next phase of my life that's necessary for me to accomplish so that I can, you know, continue to stair step into, into, to, into having a successful life. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and I'm so glad you brought that up, especially when we talk about college for so many people going to college is kind of this, I have to thing like, uh, you know, kind of like I was with school. It's like, I don't want to go to college, but I have to, or I'm not going to be able to get a job or I have to, or my parents are going to freaking disown me or I have to do the same. So uh, that's really interesting. So for you, what did that decision look like when it came to college? Was it, you know, how did you view it? Was it, uh, this is the only way for me to have a better life or, you know, what was kind of the internal conversation around the decision about whether or not to go to school in the first place? Well, that wasn't an option. So my father went to college on the, I mean, on a uh, athletic scholarship to run track with the Morehead yeah. State. And my mother went to college, but she, uh, she didn't finish. I think she stayed a semester. And so it was more so of me telling myself this, this has to happen. And, and I've, I've got to make it happen. I, it wasn't the people around me that was going to college. It was just something that was, it was necessary. It was the next step. It, it was, you go to high school, you go to college because your father went, your mother went, right. she attended. So this is just your next step. Um, but my mindset started shifting too around the same time. And it's, I started to say, okay, you know, if I'm able to go to college, let me be excellent too. So let me figure out what that looks like as I progress um, in life to the next step. And I'm curious in your particular situations, you talked about your dad telling you, Hey, like, I'm not going to be able to pay for this. So do you remember when you realized that it was a possibility for you to go because of your athletic talents? Um, and, you know, kind of a, a sub question to that is if not, did you have a backup plan? Were you thinking about maybe paying your own way or did you just make up your mind at some point and say, I'm going to go and football's the way and I'm going to make this happen? There was never a doubt. I, my dad said this to me early on, but I was, I was really, I was good my freshman year, mm -hmm. but I was really good my sophomore year. And so in, in high school, when he said it to me, it was kind of like, okay, I'm getting some letters. I'm getting some attention from some, from small level schools, right. not really knowing what, what that looks like, what that process is like. No one's ever went through it in football. So, but there was never a doubt in my mind that football uh, wouldn't be my ticket to college. I knew for a fact I was going to college and it was going to be because uh, I, I would, I would earn a scholarship to play ball. 
Um, I didn't know where, but I knew that that was that. There was no backup plan. I didn't have a plan B. Um, I really don't believe in plan Bs, honestly. <laughs> there's, so there's two valuable points that, that I'm, I'm hearing in your story that I want to just make sure that the listeners are paying attention to. So one, and I've talked about this before, but everybody I know that is truly happy is walking their own path. They're self-directed. They're living the path that they want for themselves. They're not walking down somebody else's path for them. And what I'm noticing was you is it, it seemed like you almost did that at a, at a very young age. I mean, a lot of people we're talking, they get in their fifties before they stop and look and they're like, I've been an accountant for 30 years and I never wanted to be an accountant. I wanted to be a musician or something like that. And here you are in your teens saying, I'm going to college. Football is going to take me there. It's going to happen. I mean, you just, you seem to have this decisiveness that most people have. And I want to find out where that came from. But the other thing I want the listeners to be paying attention to is, is how strong your mindset was about just deciding that a thing was going to be done. I mean, by most standards, I, w would you agree that you didn't have it as easy as a lot of people had it? You didn't have as many, you know, um, privileges or things that other people might have had to, to sort of pave this way for you. Is that, would you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely somebody that my circumstances weren't, you know, and I wouldn't say that they were the worst. I'm not going to come off sure. and say my circumstances were the worst, but I had pretty bad circumstances. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of odds against, you know, myself, my sister, you know, my parents, where they come from and all of these different economic things, you know, right. that we just didn't know, you know what I'm saying? And so, yeah, I would definitely say, you know, I come from a situation where it's easy to get caught up in drugs, easy to get caught up in, you know, whatever that's around you, the environment that you're immersed in at that time. Yeah. And so I, you know, anybody that's listening, that's just thinking, you know, it's, it's just, it's very easy a lot of times to become victim to our circumstances and be like, well, I, I would do it, but I'm too old or I'm too young or I'm too whatever to do this thing that I dream of doing. And, and I just want your story to kind of be a testament to the fact that, Hey, you know, most of that is in your mind. Your mindset can carry you so far and, um, you know, we'll talk again about sports and all that and how far it took you, but I just, I really want to hit on that in case anybody is falling into that victim mindset that, you know, it can be done if you put your mind to it. Absolutely. So college was obviously a big decision. Um, I've heard that University of Kentucky was not your first pick. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> well, so, so there's a funny story. It, it's not that it wasn't my first pick because I, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. So you know, my desire was to play uh, for the Cardinals. That was that was that was my dream to do. Cardinals, University of Louisville, right? The Louisville Cardinals, yes, sir. Um, however, Kentucky was my only pick. I didn't get. I wasn't heavily recruited, so I only had one offer coming out of college, uh, a major D one offer coming out of high school. Rather, I had one major D one offer coming out of high school, and it was Kentucky, and they loved me. And it wasn't even at the position that I wanted to play. It was at safety, which I'm not a defensive player. And so I just asked, I said, is it okay for me to come up here and, you know, and, and audition as a receiver, you know, and if you don't like it, I'll go to safety. And they told me, yeah. And so um, I didn't have an option. You know what I'm saying? Like I didn't have Louisville offering me. They weren't really recruiting me. And um, it, it just, it, it wasn't it wasn't that I wanted to go to Kentucky or I didn't want to go to Kentucky. That was just my only choice. Yeah. And this is kind of a tangent, but again, you know, having done some research on you for this interview, your high school record is almost just as impressive as your college record. I mean, it's like no shortage of, you know, being first or second at so many different things. I'm just curious as somebody who's not very tapped into the sports world. Yeah. Um, you know, what do you, what do you think kept you from being heavily recruited? What, was it visibility? Was it, uh, you know, the area you're from? Was it the position you play? That's a great question. I, I honestly would be lying if I answered that question with some type of answer. I don't know. I could assume that the answer probably would have been um, my high school, maybe, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but, but we, we were successful. I mean, we, we beat teams that we hadn't beaten years. I'm talking about a decade, you know, and, I was one of the top two to three players in the state consistently every single year. Right. And maybe it was because I played quarterback and that wasn't my natural position. Um, and the offense that I ran, it was, it was, I was an athlete. And so yeah, I was able to do things that a lot of other people couldn't because of how athletic I was. And so maybe that played a, a huge, you know, role in, in, in my lack of being recruited, but I think God has a purpose. And so I think that everything that happened to me worked out perfectly. 
Uh, if I had went to any other school, I don't think I would have gotten the opportunity that I got. And, and having one offer, it made it easy for me. So I didn't, I didn't have to take visits. I didn't have to do all of those other things. There were other schools interested, but no one ever offered me. And it was, it was, just, it was just Kentucky. I just want to pause on something you said, because that, that is something I've realized is a, a pivotal mindset for people who succeed is what you said about everything worked out perfectly. I don't think it would have gone any better if it went differently because so many times when we're in the middle of a challenge or a struggle or something happens that's different from that way we wanted it to go or what our expectations are, so many people, that's, they just stop there. They just, it, you know, why me? Why did this happen? Nothing ever good ever happens for me. And the people that succeed are the ones that recognize that all the stuff that happens to you is actually happening for you. Yeah. And it's making you better. And you just may not realize it for three, five, seven, ten 10 years. But I think that mindset is so powerful. If for no other reason, it just allows you to be happier with what's happening in your life, right? Well, I've heard this quote, and I can't remember exactly where I heard it from, but God sees your life like it's a parade. He can see the beginning and the end of it. And there are certain, there are certain turns and twists that you want to make that are comfortable and may feel like it's the best decision at that moment. But he deters you and he holds you up to save you from something that could have happened that, that could have ruined everything that he had planned for you. And so you're 100% right. You're 100% right. Yeah, I love that. And Gary Vaynerchuk, he's a you know, big media influencer. He talks about this a lot because you know, young people always come to him asking, like, well, I don't know what to do. I'm getting out of college. What should I do? And you know, what's the right decision? And he's like, there's no right decision. Just pick one. Because yep. the path that you look at and think that's the perfect path, you might take this job that pays you twice what you're worth and get on a plane to fly for travel and, and that plane crashes two years from now. Or you might take this job that sucks paying nothing and you live a life that is full and happy and all that. He's like, you, have no, you don't know the next 10 steps. You just know this next one. So yeah. you just take that one and you, know, you talked about God having faith that this whole thing's gonna work out. I think that's so, so powerful. So obviously on top of being an awesome athlete, I, I'm, I've come to learn from looking at your story and really diving into everything you've gone through that you're also extremely resilient. Like I would say above average resilient in the face of adversity. So 2007, you were limited at your ability to play at the Music City Bowl due to knee and ankle issues. And then that same year had to skip the Senior Bowl to have knee surgery at the end of the season. Is that right? Yeah. And you were still second on the team in receiving. <laughs> like. Right just completely mind boggling the amount of performance that you put up. So I would love to talk for a second about injuries because I know that mentally that can be a major, major problem for athletes, right? One day you're running, you cut, everything feels good. The next day you run, you cut, your knee hurts. And now anytime you're doing that again, you've got that thing in the back of your head and saying, am I going to get hurt? You know, it's, it just creates, it can create some fragility in your mindset. So I'd really love to hear you talk about how you, you know, it, you know, how you experienced that adversity and how you faced it and, and sort of how you got yourself back to come back and perform as well as you did. Well, in college, the, the, because the goal, the goal was the most important thing. It was I was never focused on whether or not I was hurt or I couldn't play or I could play. I was just focused on the goal and everything else was going to take care of itself regardless. So at a point in my college career, I knew for a fact, there was no doubt. It, I was I was 100% sure. I was certain that I was going to play in the NFL. I was certain there was nothing that was stopping that. And so regardless of how many setbacks I had, regardless of how many things went wrong, um, I knew that that didn't matter because I was still focused on the goal. It didn't, I, now don't get it twisted. I still had fears and there was still doubt sometimes. Right. There was, they were still there. But my belief in myself and my ability never wavered. You know what I'm saying? That never wavered. So yeah, I, I overcome a lot of, I overcame a lot of things in college and in college, I could overcome it, but in my professional career, I couldn't overcome it. And mentally, mentally. There's, man, there are just so many gems in your story that I, I really hope people are paying attention to. So the one thing you said was um, the goal never changed. Never. Even though there were bumps and bruises and things that didn't go the way you wanted them to, like the end goal that you had in mind was still the same. And that never, you just kept moving forward, whatever the next right step was. And I can, I can relate to that so much, man, because when I went in the military, the, the training for me to become special forces was three years. And that, I mean, that's more than most people commit to a job nowadays, a yeah. marriage, shoot. So three years is a long time, but it's the, one of the things that made it easy for me to do the hard things that came with that was that, like you said, the goal never changed. I always had 
this thing that I knew I was moving towards right. actually made it so much easier to just keep doing the next thing you needed to do. So right. that's, that's so powerful. And I think, you know, for the people listening, that's one of the major weaknesses I see with, with people who have are dissatisfied with life or have any just aren't where they want to be. If you ask them what they're one, what's the one thing you're working towards, they don't have an answer. Yep. And yep. that's a big reason that you're going nowhere is because you don't even know what your final direction is. So yeah, that's so important. Um, I love that. So you kept your mindset strong. Obviously you, you had to do some physical work to get back, back up and we all have ups and downs. I'm just curious on the mindset. Did you, did you have any, or do you remember any particular moments where it, it did feel overwhelming? You know, the whole, like the prospect of being, having to recover or when you got injured and just thinking, Oh my gosh, is this, is this the end? Like, did you ever have those moments? And, and I'm curious if you did what your internal game looked like to, to come back from that and not let it take over your mindset. You know, I'm going to be very transparent with you. Yeah. Uh, the draft day, draft day. I mean, I, so, you know, I was a projected first round pick mm -hmm. coming back, you know, going back to my junior year and coming out my senior year. Um, and the, the day of the draft, I didn't get drafted on the first day. No receivers did. Second day came. And there was some some guys taken in the second, I think it was the second and second round. And then rounds three, four, and five, I think, were the next day. And I slept after the first two rounds. I was just frustrated. And um, and I remember sleeping, which and it felt like hours, man. It felt like I would sleep for a long time. And I felt like, you know, um, I didn't get drafted. I woke up and I was like, it was 20 minutes later. And, and my, my tight end got drafted. Jacob Tammy got drafted a pick before me. And then I got the call. That whole time, I doubted everything. I was dreaming about not playing football. It was so bad. And so um, my mindset wasn't the greatest. I'll, I'll be the first to tell you. I felt like a failure. I felt like I was embarrassed. It was, it was bad. I mean, I was a projected first-round pick. I was the, one of the leading receivers at my school. And this happens. And, you know, I felt, I felt like I failed. So, so what did you, I mean, in that moment, what did you do? I mean, how did you, how did you come back from that? I mean, obviously it wasn't like you feel that way and the next you're like, Oh, by the way, you get picked. So how did you manage it? Did you have any, you know, by, at that point you've been playing sports for a long time and, and obviously, you know, working on your mindset, it'd been strong for most of your life. So I'm just curious if you had any particular, you know, methods or things that you, you did to get yourself back in the game. Self-talk. So when I woke up, it, I didn't get drafted as soon as I woke up. But I, so when I woke up, uh, you know, I, I felt I just felt bad. And I just, you know, you talk to yourself. It's just like after you take it's like I'm sure when in, in the military, it's like you're, you're going through some type of uh, really tough training and you got to talk yourself through it. And it's exactly what I did. I'm like, all right, KB, look, it ain't the end of the world. All we need is an opportunity. That's it. That's all we need. And so once you come to grips with you have control regardless. And I felt like even if I didn't get drafted, I was going to get a shot. It Again, I'm going to the NFL regardless. The goal right. never changed. So I started to kind of tell myself, all right, we're fine. We're good. And boom, it happened. I get the call. Yeah, that's – Again, man, that's so powerful. Even if, you're, if your ideal outcome doesn't happen, there's, that doesn't mean there's no opportunities. Right, and, right. And I, I just, I think about how much pain you would have been in if your whole world rested on actually becoming a first round draft pick. Man. Think about yeah. how painful that would have been because you didn't get it just the way you thought it should be or the way you deserved it to be. So, you know, you, you sort of, you could have made your suffering much worse like most people do this is why I'm talking about this. Like most people do because they have this picture perfect path. They want to walk down. It doesn't go that quite that way. And then they just get lost in, you know, woe is me. And why does all this bad stuff happen? Instead of saying, you know what? All right. Plan one didn't work. How about plan one, a plan there one, B plan one, C. And yeah, I mean, you're, you're just like a living Testament to the ability to like bounce back from, from so much adversity because you came back, you did get drafted the fourth round, right? Yep. You got drafted in the fourth round. You go on to play with St. Louis. And in your rookie year, you were the top receiver on your team going into the 10th game. Like, that, that's not nothing. You know what I mean? Like, you, by most rights, are underexperienced, uh, probably undersized. Like, 
these dudes are pros, man. They've been playing in this thing for a year. You come out and you're the top receiver. And um, why do you think, what do you think contributed to your success in that way? Determination. A, a lot of it just has to, I think a lot of it just has to do with the fact that you feel like you belong and you're willing to put the work in. A lot of times, a lot of people are not willing to put the work in. They're not, they, 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 they make a decision. Um, they, they, they've already made a decision to not do what's necessary to be excellent. And for me, it wasn't about proving that I, that I belonged there. I was there. It, it was, okay, now that I'm here, I want y'all to know exactly who I am now. So let me show you how great I am. Yeah, That's so powerful. Man. So yeah, you crushed it in your first 10 games. Obviously you went in your 10th game and you face another injury. And by this point, this was nothing new for you. You'd been injured before. So I'd love to hear you talk about, you know, if this was the same, if you kind of just chalked this up as like, oh, I've been here, done that. Or if, it, I guess at what point did you know that maybe this was a little bit different and you might be facing a different outcome? So the situation you're referring to was in my second year. Oh, was so it? You receiver in my second year and then the team. Can't trust game. Wikipedia, man. You can't trust them. So, <laughs> so here's what happened. Now, this one was different. This situation was different because this injury – um, was a very se severe injury. And so um, I had never been here before. I had to have uh, my patella tendon repaired. Oh, wow. So I really didn't know exactly how that was going to respond to what, what I had to do on the field. Yeah. It gave me a 12 to 15 month recovery. I think I was back in eight months. Wow. Um, which turned out to be great for my mentality, but didn't really turn out to be great for my injury because uh, there were some things that the surgeon had done that um, uh, weren't right, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. At a term. So um, I just, I just, I knew that this one would, this one I would, ha I, I had to overcome a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for know. anybody who's, you know, maybe not familiar. So, uh, so yeah, knee injuries are bad, obviously, but there are, are potentially some positions that may not struggle with them as much, but the, the downside of being a receiver or somebody is doing that is a lot of very explosive changes of direction. And a lot of that force goes into your knee. So if you have anything that's weak there and you start doing some of these cuts or, or, you know, anything that a receiver is going to have to do, then it, it can, you know, it puts a lot of stress on your joints. So I could see where that'd be really hard for you to come back from. Absolutely. Um, so what point, so you, you had your surgery, you came back in eight months. At what point did you realize that you weren't going to be able to come back and that you needed to start thinking about what was after this? Man, that is a great question. So I think I knew during rehab that something was really wrong. Yeah. I knew that that wasn't because I was in so much pain and I was like, what? So I think I knew then that there was something wrong with me. Um, but I didn't, and this was in 2010. So in two, I, I didn't realize it was over until 2012 though. Okay. So I had been removed from playing with St. Louis for two years yeah. before I realized that it was over because I refused to give up on my dream. I refused, right. um, you know, and that's neither here nor there, but that's when I accepted that it was over. Yeah. So I'm glad you said it. So you accepted it. And I'm curious because I, you know, in doing some research for this, was there a point, I was told there was a point where I guess it would have been your girlfriend at the time said, I'll support you no matter what. And that didn't sit real well with you. No, no. So yeah. So my wife now was my, she was my girlfriend at the time. And at that time, I was a horrible boyfriend because I was emotional. I was horrible, bro. It, you know. Um, I own so, it, man. Hey, nobody comes out good at it. You know what I mean? You know, listen. And so her biggest thing was support. And she's always been so supportive of me, man. Like, it's yeah. it's the craziest thing. In fact, the day that I, I had sustained the industry, she, in, in injury, she jumped on a flight to St. Louis to be with me the day that I got hurt. Playing against, playing against the Saints on Sunday. I think it was a Sunday night game. And so, yeah, so she told me that she would support me no matter if I played football or not. But again, my goal was still the same. Remember, right. so it worked with you or against you. I said, don't ever say that to me. 
What do you mean? You don't, do you not believe in, in me? Are, are you, do you think that this is, this is a game for me? This is my life. This is my livelihood. I've worked for this since I was four or five years old. Don't ever say something like that to me. But what I didn't hear from her was, I love you unconditionally and I respect you. And no matter what, no matter what happens, no matter where your, where your, your, your uh, life path takes you, I'm going to be there for you. No matter what. I didn't hear that. And I almost lost her for, for, for that foolishness. Hmm. No, man, I, I, so yeah, I definitely don't agree that it was the right answer, but I can totally relate, man, because I did a very similar thing getting into the military. I worked, you know, I went in late too at 26 years old. Most of the people in my, my basic training were 18, 20 young guys. I, I quit an otherwise pretty good life, went to join the military just because it was something I dreamt of doing, spent three years doing it, got there a year later, I'm deployed. I wasn't diagnosed, but we realized I had a heart issue. And then six months later, I got diagnosed. And basically my options were, you can have surgery on your heart or you can get out of the military. And it was just like, damn, like those are yeah. not really, yeah, I just wanted there to be a plan C, you know? Yeah. Um, but I can totally relate to the frustration of like, I got, I, here I am, I got all this way. And now it's, it's not up to me anymore. I guess, yeah, I mean, similar to your story, it'd been up to you the whole time. The only thing that got you into the pros was because it was up to you and you decided it was going to happen. And then suddenly it wasn't up to you anymore. And I could just totally relate to, you know, the frustration and emotions, everything that comes with that for sure. But, you know, God love you for hanging on to Tracy. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. So obviously you went through rehab and I would imagine the, the you know, repairing and, and working on that, the physical therapy and all that was probably similar to what you had to do in college. And um, what I want to talk about is, you know, when, when you did realize it was over, was that like a, a day or did it sort of creep up on you over six months? I mean, what did that look like until you finally were like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm done with it. I mean, at some point they released you, right? So, so I got released in September the 7th uh, in 2010. So I got released then. Oh, so, so that wasn't long after your injury. That would have been, or no, you got, yeah, you got injured in 2010, right? I got injured in 09. Okay. Yeah. Then I got released in September. The next, so yeah, in September of 2010. And so, uh, so, so basically I had, I had, I mean, I had, I had the Bears, the Redskins, I had Philadelphia, the, the Eagles, I had the Texans. I had so many different teams wanting to bring me in, um, wanting to work me out because they wanted to sign me. The Giants, I had a lot of teams that really wanted my services, um, but I wasn't healthy. So, I took that time to rehab and really try to get myself together. Uh, long story short, I had to have two more surgeries after that to repair wow. the damage that the other doctor had done. Wow. And then that, so that was a year recovery. So in 2011, you know, it's like, okay, now I'm feeling like myself. Well, the problem then becomes my knee's not functioning the right way. So then I was supposed to have a, I was supposed to go trial for the Texans and I had to, de I had to decline. And I said, I'm, I'm not just not healthy. I can't go. My trainer said, no, we're not putting anything else bad on film. We're not doing that. We're not going. Um, and then 2012, I got an invite to the Cardinals uh, mini camp. So I went to their mini camp. And in 2012, I did okay. I did well. But I was in so much pain. Mm. And I walked off the field. And, and at that moment, I said to myself, it's over. It's over. You know, you've done all that you can do. And, and – there's some regret there. I don't hold on to it like I used to because I felt like I wasted time. I felt like I, it was necessary for me to, I should have said, okay, this is, it's over earlier. Oh, okay. So you actually, you said you're, you, you had regret because you feel like you held on to it too long. I held on way too long. Way Interesting. too long. Okay. Way too long because your emotion gets, because again, the goal is always the same, but, it, there, but sometimes the path becomes different. The goal is never, and I, I learned this later after my situation in the NFL, but I didn't want the fame. I didn't want these other things. That, that's not what I wanted. I just wanted a better life for my, fam my family, my right. sister, my mom, my father, my wife, and my children to be. That's all I wanted. That's all I cared about. That was the goal. That was the goal the whole time. Yeah. I didn't really go out like that when I played in the NFL. I didn't have, you know, crazy women coming in and out of my house. That's not what I, that wasn't right. me. 
I was so invested in the process. I was so invested in, 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 in the grind. That was something that I was addicted to. It was something that I, I, I wanted so bad and I had it in the structure that when that was over, it, it almost broke me. It almost broke me, but I held on way too long. If somebody would have told me, listen, you need to start making plans to do something different. At that moment, even though I wouldn't have listened to them, I, I would have appreciated it because I probably would have started thinking that before. Right. Which probably was my wife, but see, my wife is really shy at times. And so she's, she'll tell me something once and I'm like, okay, you don't want to do it. I'm not, I'm, we're not having this conversation again. Yeah, I should have listened earlier. Yeah, so you're, you're at the Cardinals camp and you walk off and you kind of realize that's it. So, you know, at that point, I, what helped you make that transition? And the reason I ask is because I, I would imagine that you faced something similar to what a lot of veterans face. And you go from this very structured, regimented, organized life that has a single goal. And then when you're out, it, you've got to make all your own choices. I mean, your, your life is whatever you make it, but there's really no structure there. And that, that's why so many veterans transition from the service into being a civilian and they, they fail. There's homeless veterans. we got suicide at 22 a day. Um, and I have to imagine it's, it's not the same, but it's probably similar to some of the stuff you experienced. So I just would love to hear you talk about that transition and whether it was a struggle for you and what, what, allowed you to come out on the other end and, and be okay? Well, one, let me just give respect to the vets, man, because, you know, what I went through was a cakewalk compared to the things that a lot of you guys come home from. So let me just be very clear there. So I, I think it's similar. I'm very, very um, appreciative of the lifestyle that you guys live because it's, it's exactly, to, in my opinion, the same type of mindset that we have. Right. Um, but, but the transition was – it was incredibly difficult. I mean, there are times where I still struggle with the transition, not from a, not from a financial or physical perspective, but from a mental perspective. Yeah. Cause you're living with, uh, you're living with this, 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 this thought that not that you failed, which, which makes it bad because that's not what makes it bad. Failure is in, I would rather fail a million times than to never try and never have the opportunity to succeed. You see what I'm saying? hundred um, percent. But, but I think the hardest part of the transition is knowing that you can never do the thing that you love doing the most. Right. Football, my, my wife, my son and football are really close to each other in my, in, in my spirituality, They're extremely close to each other imagine somebody taking one of your kids and you can never see them again, but you know that they're okay. Right. That's exactly what it feels like to lose the, the thing that you love. Like people don't understand. It's not a lot of times the lifestyle that was your goal. Right. You've never had another one. So the reason why guys like yourself, like vets or myself in, in, in professional athletics, you never set another goal. That's why you struggle. That's the main reason why you struggle. Right. You don't have a goal. So that's the, the struggle. And then even though I have goals now and the goal is always to dominate those goals, which I love, there's nothing like that. There's nothing yeah, like I, that. First goal. What you're saying resonates so much with me because there's, uh, first of all, I think that is where a lot of veterans fall down is they don't, they never purposely identify what the next mission is after that, the military. That's good. That's and good. I think the guys that do do really guys and gals that do do really well. It's just getting clear on what is your purpose afterwards. Maybe your purpose is to be a stay at home dad. Maybe your purpose is to be an investor, whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is you just need to be clear on what is your direction now. Right. And yeah, I mean, what you're talking about with, you know, sort of being forced away from things. I think that's a big reason that, athletes and veterans as well, especially the veterans who, who are forced out, who get injured and don't have a choice. You know, they might be third generation veterans. They wanted to do this their whole life. And then suddenly you go do the thing you've always wanted to do. You get hurt and then that's it. And right. I, I think, I, I think it's totally normal that they face that. I think where we could do better for anybody, athletes and veterans alike, where we could do better for anybody is helping them make that transition. And that's actually one of the, one of the things that really weighs heavily on me is trying to, to be that conversation for people about, Hey, like find your purpose, whatever it is, just choose it and move on to it. So 
what did you identify, I guess, as your purpose? Because you, you landed on your feet, all things being considered. I mean, you, you've done very well for yourself and seem to be just knocking it out of the park at everything that you do. So I'm curious how you made that possible. I mean, what, what did you do during transition and, and how, did you, how did you overcome that adversity to being successful and where you are now? Well, first I cried. Yeah. That was the first thing. First I cried. Um, and I say that because I want people to understand it. You know, you don't have to be perfect. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm very vulnerable. You know what I'm saying? And I, I, I'm, not a, a, um, I'm not afraid to show any type of side that I have because it's who I am. So the first thing I did was I mourned the loss of the, the love that I had at that moment, which was, which was my goal, which was my dream. It died that day. Okay. And then from there, it took me a while. It took me a couple of years, to believe it or not, to really find my way. And then um, when you talk about purpose, and I know uh, we'll talk about this at some point, but my purpose was to build a legacy for my son. And that legacy isn't, it's not all financial. You know, right. I want to leave a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of love, uh, and a wealth of inspiration in him and through him and any other children that I have. And that's cliche. Um, and I, you know, so that's that. But I just wanted to add value to people somehow. I didn't understand how to create wealth. I didn't understand how to what you know how to create passive income. I didn't understand that. So I decided to start researching things that I can get involved with for a small amount of money to start my own business because I had failed at a, a, a franchising business, um, which I thought was part would, would have helped me with my purpose. But it was something that I just didn't want to do, and it's something I, I shouldn't have gotten involved with in the first place. And so uh, it took me a while. But I started finding purpose in helping people. I started finding purpose in getting better who I was, knowing myself outside of playing football, trying to figure out what the best version of myself looked like. Um, and I started finding purpose in just being the best possible version of myself outside of the thing that I lost. Man, I feel like every time you open your mouth, there's like a golden nugget for anybody who's trying to accomplish anything in their life. So first, I want to back up to what you said about mourning the loss of the thing. That, for whatever reason, that like that sadness, um, you know, grief, like the, those emotions, it, for whatever reason, we all seem kind of programmed to want to hide them. We, we right. don't, we don't want to be grie uh, grieving in front of people. We, we want to kind of present this front that everything's okay. And man, it's all of your emotions. It's so important to experience them. Like the death of a loved one. Do not act like it didn't happen. It happened. Right. Feel it it's the only way that you can process it enough to move on through it. And, and then you talked about, it took you three years to get to, you know, basically identifying your next purpose. And this is so important for me because one of the main things that I think people mess up in setting goals and, and trying to create a better life for themselves now is they zoom in too much with their timeline and they don't take a bigger look at things. And it just, because if, at any point during those three years, so many people would have said like, Hey man, it's been a year get over it. Or it's been a year and a half or two years. But the point is that there's no answer for that. It no. takes as long as it takes. Right. And there's no way that we would know. We don't know what you're going to do 10 years from now because of those three years. So if we zoom in to just those three years, it looks like Keenan's just wallowing in his misery and, you know, doing all these things. But if you zoom out a little bit, you look at that, that, you know, quote unquote tragedy as part of a bigger picture. And it start, you, it starts to make sense. Right. And it's like you said earlier, like you, you couldn't be who you are without those things. No. So um, I, I just, I, I really hope that people value the adversity in their own lives because that adversity is breeding something in you that you will need later, whether you know it or not. Absolutely. And I, I love that so much. So one thing I want to just kind of take a side road on real quick, because I just, just for my own education, you talked about, you know, wanting, um, you know, you had football obviously, and, and that's, you get paid a lot of money to play football. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are on, it seems to me, you, you take somebody like you who comes from a, a home that has enough, but not a ton. You have a lot of people around you who are probably struggling financially and in a lot of other ways. And then suddenly you're in this position where people want to give you a lot of money. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are or how you saw that play out with, with these guys. I mean, is there anybody there holding their hand saying, hey man, here's how to manage $5 million a year or a million dollars a game or whatever it is, or 
does everybody kind of have to figure that out on their own? And like, what does that journey look like? Because that seems to me like that would be one of the major challenges of being thrust into professional sports. Well, one, every situation is not built equally, right? Sure. So you have a lot of people that come into the NFL where their parents have um, the means and the education to understand finances. But then you have situations where like mine, you know, let's just say that on the high end, if my mom's never made more than thirty-five dollars to $40,000 a year, now she's the one that's choosing my financial advisor. And it's based on, well, I didn't get a chance to help you choose your agent, so I want to do this. Right. So now, you, now you, you, you're already behind the eight ball. So the point I'm making is, you know, there's nobody holding your hand because you don't know who to trust. And you right. think everybody yeah, does. Absolutely. There was, there's a lot of things that 30, 35 year old Keenan would have told 22 year old Keenan. There's a lot of things that that 22 year old Keenan would do differently. If my son decides that professional athletics is his deal and he wants to do it, the wealth of knowledge that I have now, he'll never have to go through anything remotely close to what I went through. And even if he doesn't choose to be a professional athlete, just financially, from a financial perspective in general, he'll know so much different than I did. Right. You know what I mean? And, and see, that's the thing, but it's not that there's not resources there. There are some resources for you. It's just, you just don't know which resources to take advantage of. Right. Yeah. It's the same thing in the military, right? You have a, an 18 year old kid who's, who's never done anything but live with their parents and they come in and suddenly they're getting paid X number of thousand dollars per month. And turns out their, their housing and their food and all that's paid for. And they end up with a bunch of cash that, they've never had before. And there's plenty of resources on a military post to help you learn how to budget and use your money and all that. But young kid, I mean, they don't know what they don't know. You know, it's just, there you go. you're, you're 10 feet tall and invincible and money's going to last forever. And why would you be wise about it? And so um, I just, I can only imagine with it being, you know, a hundred thousand, 10 hundred, you know, or not 10, uh, a million or a million and a half, five, like that's a whole nother discussion and getting two, $3,000 a month, but that's awesome. So, that was kind of a trans, you know, just kind of a tangent I wanted to walk down, but you, you mentioned obviously your son and obviously your dad was super important to you and, and sports and all that. And I'm really glad you brought up with him in the sports. I'm very curious, just having come from parents who were athletes and you being an athlete, you know, is there, I mean, do you secretly want for him to be an athlete or, you know, I guess, you know, what, what is your, what does your mind and your heart say on that in terms of, you know, the path that he chooses to go down? I want him to be athletic. I want him to desire to play sports. Can I say that I desire for him to play, to become an NFL football player or be, be, be an NBA basketball player? I don't care. You know, I don't care. Honestly, I just want him to be excellent. That's it. I just want him to, to give 110% any and everything that he does. But ultimately, my goal is to show him how to create his own wealth. That I, you know, because ultimately, that's all that matters. People can say all day, "Oh, it's not about the money." No, forget that. It is about the money. It is, it is. You know, um, you know, I've been I've been poor before, and I've been rich before. And 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 I'll tell anybody any day, I highly recommend the rich side. <laughs> Highly yeah, recommend absolutely. that side. You know what I mean? And because it's not the money, it's what you can do with it. It's the lives that you can change. It's how it makes you feel when you're able to give. Right. You're able to give good advice. That's good. But you're able to follow it up with financial gifts for people. That's yeah. great. So, you know, my, my goal for him is I want him to carry the legacy that I have um, further than I could have ever thought. If that means that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm able to, to generate, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars for our family, I want him to take it into billions of dollars for our family yeah. and, our, and our family name. You know, that's, that's what I want for him. I want, I, want, I want him to be excellent in whatever he does. If it's professional athletics, awesome. He'll be ready. He'll be ready for that. That's, that's easy. But if it's business, his mom's an amazing tax account. She'll probably make partner here in the next year or so. That's awesome. You know, I mean, there's so many different avenues that my son's going to have that I, that I didn't, or that his mom didn't even have. Right. Yeah. It's so, and there's a couple of things that you said that really stand out to me. So one, yeah, money, 
listen, money, you can say what you want about money, but it's part of the game we're playing as humans right now. Absolutely. It just is. And at the end of the day, money in almost every way you can possibly think of is freedom. Money is freedom oh. from having to go to a nine to five. Money is freedom from having to mow your own yard. Money is freedom from having it like you insert thing here. Enough money will make you free from being obligated to do that thing. And like you said, it also liberates you and gives you the freedom to bless people. So now when you see a problem in the world and somebody's hurting, somebody lost their job because of coronavirus and they need $3,000 a month, money can make that pain go away. Absolutely. And it, it's just, it, I mean, I, I, I really want to just open up people's minds to the fact that money is really kind of a, um, amoral. It's not good or bad. It's just what you do with it. And yeah, I think by, by most measures, every good person should strive to have as much money as they should have. They want to have because you could think about how much good you can do. God, God put us on the earth. It, it, be fruitful, you know, be fruitful and multiply. That doesn't just go with generational uh, right. lineage. That goes with everything. Be fruitful and multiply everything that is given to you. My goal is to, when I, when I die, I, I, I walk through those gates and, and he says, do you feel like you use your potential? And my answer to him is yes. Everything that you gave me, I tried to multiply seven, tenfold. Right. Because it was a gift from you. And if that means that, you know, my mindset has to be focused on being money driven and being uh, humble with being money driven, money driven, that's just what I'm going to do. Right. You know, because he doesn't want me to struggle. If I'm made in his image, that means I'm great. Right. So what does greatness look like? That's all aspects of life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're not doing anybody any favors by by not having something because you think it's noble or, or whatever. Um, and I, I love what you've, you've said a couple of times now about really like striving to be your best self. You want your son to be excellent because it, for me that I pay respect to the people who raised me and the people who raised them by learning from their mistakes and not making them over again. And by pushing the ball a little bit further down the field. Right. You know, the, my, my, if my son is making the same mistakes as a kid that my dad made, I'm, I'm the, the breaking point somewhere. I have failed. I should be learning from the things my dad did. I should be doing them better. And then I should be teaching my son to do them even better than I did. And right. that's how we get better, right? Like there's, you can even look socially. There's been more innovation in the last 20 years than the last hundred before that. So right. this is a law of nature. I mean, we are constantly innovating and evolving and getting better. And um, I think that's so important. And, and one of the reasons that really stood out to me when you were talking about is because even in the absence of a clear purpose, sometimes just getting better is the purpose. Exactly. Even if you're having trouble identifying what, what am I moving towards? What is my one goal right now? Sometimes that one goal in the face of everything else can just be self-improvement. I'm getting a little bit smarter. I'm getting a little bit stronger. I'm getting a little bit whatever. Um, and, and that could be in, especially in, the, in a situation where you're, you know, recovering for two years from an injury and you're trying to bounce back from that. Sometimes just having that purpose of getting a little bit better every day is enough to keep you in the right mindset. Absolutely. And I just think that's so important. So, so now you're a dad and I would love to hear you talk about one thing that one thing that, uh, about sports and, and being an athlete, being an athlete your entire life, you think has made you a better dad. And I would love to hear about one thing you've changed your mind on since you actually had a kid. I can say those again if you need me to, but. I think I got it. I'll ask though, you know that. Um, one thing that sports has done that's, that's helped me in my parenting, my son probably would be my patience. Um, as a receiver, there's something that we talk about. It's something that, when you get pressed, like when the DB is up close to you and just be patient at the line and make a move to, to get around that DB. I realized that being patient allows my son to be in, and become who he is and who he wants to become. I know before I would always say by this age, my son's going to be catching a football or shooting a basketball or swinging a bat, which he can do all of those things. Right. But it's more so about him becoming his true self and me not trying to influence that based on 
what I think or or based on my limiting beliefs. Right. So me not allowing him to explore certain things based on my fear about him getting hurt. So me being patient enough to say, hey, jump off the bed and see what it feels like. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, just so just things like that. And the second portion to that is um, I thought that he would listen to everything that I said. I thought that I would be able to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> And like, I got it, man, being a father is a breeze. I got it. And I realized that once you figure something out, it changes the next day. Yeah, absolutely. It's a consistent moving target. It consistently is moving and, you know, he's changing day by day. Like this morning, he didn't want me to come and get him out of his bed. He wanted his mom. Mm -hmm. But he walks in the room, looks her in her eye, looks her in her eyes, and then walks back in his room and stands at his door and cries and says, mom, come get me. Like just to have the thought process to say, okay, you know, so it's just, you, he got his own mind. It's he, right. he is who he is to the core. And I love it. I love every moment. So That's so funny. Yeah. It's, so yeah, my kids will be doing something that isn't, you know, it's not going to kill them, but it's a little bit risky or dangerous. And I'm like, Hey, if I was you, I wouldn't do that. And just in one ear out the other, man. It's like, what, what? What would you think? Why do you think I'm trying to trick you? Like this, it's not a game. I'm just, I'm actually trying to share my wisdom with you, but yeah, they don't want to have anything to do with it. So <laughs> yeah, it takes a, a different kind of patience, man. That's fantastic. So I, I'm just curious, you know, and I, I don't know, obviously you're, you're very driven and you set goals. I'm just curious to hear you talk about what, what the next five years looks like or the next 10 years looks like for you. So I want to have at least a um, hundred million under management in real estate. Um, that's, I think for me, it has to be lofty. I have goals, uh, in the next 15 years to be a billionaire. I don't know necessarily how that's going to happen. You know, I don't know what God's going to put in, in, in my place in front of me to, to allow that to happen. And then also in the businesses that I have, even with Abdul Moraine, um, to become uh, a million dollar earner here in the next year. And then also be at five million dollars a month in income in the next five to ten years. So really, really focusing on helping a lot of people um, see what the, see what my vision is. But most important, man, I I want to add value to so many people. I want to give people that may uh, have come up like I have a great place to live, something they could be proud of. That's why I got into real estate. It's not just about the money, but I really want people to look at my properties and my units that I've renovated, and I want them to say you know, I can be proud to be here. They may not take care of it, but at least, but at least they have something they feel like they can be proud of. That's awesome, man. I love that what you said is so important, especially for anybody who's listening and is maybe working a job or, um, you know, isn't, doesn't, doesn't own their own thing or doesn't work for themselves yet. You, you want to add value to other people's lives. When we go back to what we talked about earlier with money being freedom, people don't just let go of their money for no reason. Right. If you want people to let go of their money and give it to you, they need to get something of value in return. And the only way you're ever going to build anything substantial is by focusing on giving value first and then just having that faith that the money will come. And yeah, man, we live in this incredible time. It has never been, especially for anybody who hears you talk about your income goals and thinks, holy cow, that's impossible. How could you do it so fast? We have never been in a better time to generate wealth. It has never been easier to give value to people worldwide. Right through the internet. I mean, if my grandfather wanted to have customers in China, he needed to have a phone book. He needed to speak Chinese. He needed to have a landline to actually get like so many things had to happen for him to ship product and, and make that happen. Now I can open a store in 30 minutes and I can be selling products worldwide. I mean, we just live in the most incredible time to be able to do exactly what you said and give value to people and add value to be able to generate wealth and return, man. So yeah, that's, I love it. That's fantastic. Well, so go well, ahead. The biggest thing, well, yeah. And the biggest thing I'll tell the people that are listening is this, it's like they, they hear the number. Sometimes the number is what shocks them. But what if, what if I'm 20% right? And I, right. and a hundred million is, let's just say it's $2 million in the management in the next 10 years. Right. What if I'm only making $20,000 a month net profit from my real estate portfolio right what if I'm only doing a hundred thousand dollars a year passively in another business you know so it, that that's the thing it's like even by failing because my goal is so big I yeah. still win right I still win 
What if I don't make it to billion dollar status, but I'm actually at $10 million of net worth and I have two to 2.5 to $3 million liquid in the bank. Right. What if that's all I have? And, and, and I failed. Had failed your and goals. Failed. But and, yeah. You know, it's, I'm reading a book. I'm reading two. Well, I, I read all the time, but I'm, I, I just got done reading a book called uh, Three Magic Words. Hmm. And it talks about the universal subconscious mind. And it talks about how when you, it, everything is connected. So with the thing that you desire, if you, if you think about it, it, it expands and it comes forth to you. If I think about being a billionaire and I just happen to reach 10 million or 20 million, I'm not upset. Yeah, right. I'm not upset. Yeah, I'm, absolutely. My fan, all, everybody in my family is taken care of, but then my son is going to take this 10 million and he will turn it into billions of dollars. Yep. Yeah, he will. absolutely. I love it, man. It's so good. So I know we're coming up on time, man. It's been so good talking to your story. Again, there's just so many things from it. So many lessons I learned, but also so many places where, I realize that our stories actually overlap a lot in some of the things that we've been through and some of the things we experienced. Um, so I, I'm just really thankful for everything you shared. I'd love for you to just tell people if they want to connect with you or find you online. I mean, what's the, what's the best way for people to, to track you down and get in touch with you? Man, please follow me on uh, Instagram. It's Keenan Burton, like my name. And then you can, you can um, friend me on Twitter as well. It's the same. It's Keenan Burton, no spaces. And then Facebook, it's Keenan Burton as well. All of it's the same. And ultimately, you know, my goal is just to add value to people. And, you know, if anybody has any questions about anything, about how to overcome any type of mindset issues, please feel, to reach, please feel free to reach out to me. I love that. And I'll post the links that he's talking about in the show notes. So if anybody needs to access those, they can do that. And the last question I got for you, Keenan, before we wrap up, what does legacy mean to you? And that's a good question. Um, legacy is not just about the people that are in front of me, whether that be my son, whether that be, you know, his children, their children, those generations. Legacy is the people's shoulders that I'm standing on, the, you know, the slave that overcame the issues that they had, you know, the coworker that had to work until their hands bled and their lungs was full. My father that worked three or four jobs, my mother that was grown up on a chicken farm um, and came from rural Indiana to Kentucky and had me. So legacy is making sure that I make those people proud, but then also taking all of those experiences from my past, from those people, uh, multiplying their successes and passing it off to my family, my son, my other children that we, we may have. And that being in the form of not only wealth, but health. Um, spirituality, um, wealth of knowledge, and love. That's what it means to me. That's awesome, man. I appreciate you sharing that so much. And I'm, I'm so grateful for your time, man. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to connect again soon. Absolutely. All right, Kenya, take care. Thank you. Thank you.